This is Eloisa with Math Leopard. Welcome to part two of my 33-part summation of Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, The Fellowcraft. In the ancient Middle East, religion was inseparable from philosophy. Those with greater spiritual aspirations were initiated into the mysteries thereof by use of symbolic teaching. These symbols, although vague to the intellect, sought to invoke specific feelings and ideas, and hence were more pregnant with meaning than mere words could convey. Masonry, the successor to these mysteries, still endeavors to teach in this same manner. The rites performed present a challenge to the initiate, and the lectures given provide only hints as to the interpretation of their meaning. The development of their meaning must be found after study and contemplation for one's self. After their expansion out of Egypt, the mysteries were modified to coincide with the religious practices of each nation. However, those initiated priests within each society were nowhere willing to share their philosophical truths with the common folk. Christianity espoused fraternity, but not equality. The monasteries fraternity and equality, but not liberty. Masonry alone claimed for men the threefold heritage of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Masonry recognizes the truth in the statement that man is supreme over institution and not they over him, and sees in it the omnipotence of God. Any who aid in the progression of truth is akin to Moses, and his intellect is in sympathy with the mind of God. Masonry is ordained to bestow manhood, science, and philosophy on its votaries, not the philosophy in opposition to religion, rather that philosophy of God and the soul which religious sentiment inspires and engenders. And not science devoid of religion, but that which sees the hand of God in every expression of nature. The first scriptures were written on the heavens and on earth, and the interpretation of these is true science. The great Bible of God is ever open before mankind. Knowledge may be transformed into power, but is not itself power. Wisdom is true power, and her prime minister is justice, or the perfected law of truth. The goal of education in science is to make a man wise, and this is the true objective of studying masonry. The wiser the man, the less inclined he will be to submit to a yoke on either his conscience or person. Wisdom gives him not only the knowledge of his rights, but a heightened understanding of their value. Mere knowledge, on the other hand, as opposed to offering freedom, often makes a more useful slave. The true mason is he who labors to help his order effect its great purpose. It is an instrument of God, willing to sacrifice its children for the good of humanity, in the manner of Abraham. The fellow craft initiate must be guided by reason, love, and faith. A faith is a necessity in man, a faith in ourselves, our fellows, and the people, lest we get too easily discouraged by the challenges we face. Without love and faith, the all-wise, all-powerful, reasonable God would have never created the universe. True genius is that which is most powerful, the prime lieutenants of which are force and wisdom. Those with the sense to see and the will to do reign with godlike power, unveiling the hidden human mysteries. Genius is a sun, and force and wisdom the glowing orbs of its political sphere casting the light of truth into the darkness. Development is symbolized by the use of the mallet and chisel, that is, the energies and intellect of the individual and the people. The power of money and might, compared to that of spirit, is poor and contemptible. Mars's intellect is the most potent of weapons. The mastery of mind over the mind is the only worthy conquest. This power, entwined with love, is the golden chain of truth that binds mankind together. The free country in which intellect and genius govern is eternal, that in which they serve and others govern finite. To elevate a people intellectually is the only mode by which a nation retains its freedom. Teach loving kindness and wisdom and impart power to those who teach the best. Thus is the free state from the rough ashlar developed. Masonry is a journey and a struggle towards a light of virtue, intelligence, and liberty for both man and nation. 
The blackness is a tyranny over the soul and body. When the unworthy and base ascend to power, the final outcome is war and the necessity for tyranny. The tyrant, once enthroned, will resort to utter savagery to remain at the expense of the nation itself. Civil and religious freedom necessarily go hand in hand. The church and the throne sustain one another. Yet it is not a single king that is needed. Instead, a free government demands that all must be kings. Liberty is the birthright of all, yet is lost just as easily by those who do not use it as by those who misuse it. The vast power of endurance, tenacity, and patience is acquired by the continual exercise of these faculties. As it is said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Virtue is the bravery to do that thing which is true, despite all temptation and doubt. Devout enthusiasm is far easier than good actions. The sole purpose of religion is an ethic. He who does right is better than he who thinks right. A gospel of love on the tongue is an avatar of persecution in the heart. Masonry does not change human nature and cannot make honest men out of born knaves. As a body without the heart is dead, so is faith without works. The intellectual capacity of a people has but one measure, the height of genius of the men bestowed to them by fate and their deference to them. There is little sympathy between the masses of men and the highest truths. The popular explanation of Masonic imagery is sufficient for the multitude who swarm their temples. If men are contented with the exoteric, while others seek to obtain higher truths, it is their misfortune. The fellowcraft is taught not to become wise in his own conceit, as pride in unsound theories is worse than ignorance. Does a proud man not err? Does he not suffer? When he reasons, is he not stopped short by difficulties? When he acts, does he never succumb to the temptations of pleasure? When he lives, is he free from pain? When he dies, can he escape the grave? Pride is not the heritage of man. Humility should dwell alongside frailty and atone for both ignorance and imperfection. A mason should never be too ambitious for high office or seek honors for himself. Rather, he should enjoy the blessings that fortune has bestowed upon him. The greatest deeds are done away from the spotlight and the crowds. He who has an attachment to solitude will be preserved from the ills of life. With freedom comes a longing for material advancement. The lust for wealth drives youth away well before its time, drawing heavy bills of exchange on age. Overreachings and greed for office are the two columns at the entrance to the temple Moloch, as either gains control of its subject, his soul withers away and decays. As such, the souls of half of humanity leave them long before they die. The fellow craft must not imagine that lowly or uninfluential work is not worthy. There is no threshold to the influence of a good deed, wise word, or generous effort. Nothing is too insignificant. The radiance of the stars benefit the rose. Worlds are created by falling grains of sand. Night distributes stellar essence to sleeping plants. Every bird of flight has the infinite within its talon. Such is the wonder of the interpretation between intellect and matter. Elements and principles combined as to entwine the material and moral realms. The universe engenders the force of both light and thought, dissolving all save the point without length, breadth, or thickness. Be myself, reduced to the soul atom, making everything blossom into God. Life is short. Thought and the influences of what we do or say are immortal. The word well spoken and the deed fitly done will echo throughout eternity. The sovereignty of man over himself is called liberty. Where two or more sovereign individuals associate, a state begins, as there is equal contribution by all to the sovereignty of the state. This concession made by each and to all is equality. The common right, which shines its rays of protection for all, is fraternity. Liberty is the summit and equality the base. Equality of opportunity, vote, and soul. 
the thoughts of the common people must be known in order to do wise and good work. We are all equal in the sight of God. Men are brought together first to differ and then to agree. Affirmation, negation, discussion, solution. These are the means of attaining truth. It is a rare man that can speak the truth honestly, frankly, and without fear, or to gain favor and affection of emperor or people. Too much talking, like too much thinking, destroys the power of action. The thought is only made perfect by the deed. The state, like the man, must ever strive to stay the path of virtue. Begging for office culminates in bribery with office, and ultimately corruption in office. Even in tyrannical states we must use love, truth, and reason as our chief weapons. A flaming sword in one hand and the oracles of God in the other. Whatever follies committed by a free people, that terrible teacher experience will make them wise in the end. Faith is the savior and redeemer of nations. The sword in the Bible represents the utterance of thought or speech, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Yet spoken words are heard by few. It is a written word which gave power and permanence to human thought. The truth writes her last words not on virgin parchment, but rather atop the scrawl that error has made and often mended. The real apostle of liberty, fraternity, and equality uses the two-edged sword of the true word and the fire of the conviction in his soul to stir the hearts of men. He will reason, teach, and rule by the sword of spirit. There is truth in all men who are not compelled to suppress their souls and speak other men's thoughts. To unlearn is to learn. We must learn to forget and, if needed, relearn that which we have forgotten. The world is conquered more so by the head than by the hand. Human thought is the most elusive of attributes to trace. The master workman must train his thoughts with his two-handed hammer. All figures of plane geometry and trigonometry, the measurement of the earth and that of triangles, respectively, can be traced out by the compass and scale. The letter G in most lodges is said to signify geometry. One, the monad, is the circumpunct of the soul atom. Two, the duad, symbolizes the antagonism of good and evil, light and darkness, Cain and Abel, Eve and Lilith, Yachin and Boaz, Ormuzd and Ariman, Osiris and Typhon. Three, the triad, is expressed symbolically by the right and equilateral triangles. There are three prime colors, blue, yellow, and red, which intermix to form the seven colors of the rainbow. There is the trinity of the deity, the generative power of vitality, the productive capacity of the soul, and the resultant spirit. These are the alchemical salt, sulfur, and mercury, or body, soul, and spirit. Four, the signature of the earth, is symbolized by the square. It is seen in the four streams of Eden. Pison, about the land of gold, Gihon, about the land of darkness, Hideko, in the east, and the Euphrates. The four winds of heaven, represented by the four chariots of Zachariah, with red, black, white, and grizzled horses, the four creatures of Ezekiel, each with the face of a man, lion, ox, and eagle. Five is the duad and the triad combined, expressed symbolically by the five-pointed or blazing star, the Pentalpha of Pythagoras. It is connected to the number seven by five loaves and two fishes, with a remainder of five plus seven, or twelve fragments. By the five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and the two greater luminaries, the sun and the moon. Seven is a sacred number. There are seven planets, or spheres, presided over by seven archangels. There are seven colors in the rainbow, as are there seven days in the week. When added to five, we have the number of months and apostles. Zechariah beheld a golden candlestick with seven lamps. John in the Apocalypse writes seven epistles to seven churches, 
in which are twelve promises. He who sends his message to Ephesus holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amid the seven golden lamps. The universe was created in seven days, and Noah took seven of each clean beast and fowl. Job had seven sons and three daughters, yielding the perfect ten. The seven eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. There are seven angels of the apocalypse, and seven plagues released from seven vials. Eight is the first cube. Nine is a square of three and represents the triangle. Ten includes all other numbers, especially three and seven. It is the Tetractus of Pythagoras, the number of patriarchs from Adam to Noah, and the number of commandments. Twelve is the number of edges of the cube, which has six faces, the number of months, tribes of Israel, and apostles and it is the number of stones on the breastplate of the high priest.